We'll try that, the intro without uh, the mute button. Well, one more time. So I said, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the June 17th, uh, 2021, regular Des Moines City Council meeting to order. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Council Member Harris to please lead us in the pledge. Uh, okay, sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Let the record show that all council members are present. And just a quick comment. Um, council, you may recall a few weeks ago, we approved a proclamation and a resolution recognizing June 19th, also known as Juneteenth. Today, the federal government decided it would also recognize this as a national holiday. I'm pleased that they saw the same wisdom that we did. With that, I just like to note that although the federal government's re uh, recognition doesn't begin until 2022, the city of Des Moines holiday begins in 2021, which means that the city closed um, okay, the city will be closed tomorrow in observance of Juneteenth. The Juneteenth flag is flying this weekend at the police department. And on Monday, the Juneteenth flag will come down to city hall for the rest of the month. On Monday, the police department um, will also then continue fl uh, flying the pride flag. So with that, are there any written correspondences? Yes, Mayor, we've received the following written public comments. Mary Oon, Marine View Drive South and Woodmont Drive. Alicia Hark, Crash Corner Letter. Sharon Morehouse, Marine View Drive South, Woodmont Drive and 265th Street. Michelle Rouse, Crash Corner in Des Moines. Courtney Robbins and Tyler Beal, Improvements Needed to Crash Corner. Dan Wallstrom, Traffic Hazards at Marine View Drive South and Woodmont Avenue Intersection. Annette, Woodmont Traffic Issues. William and Nancy Kennedy, Marine View Drive South and Woodmont Drive. Rebecca Stapleton, illegal to conduct as well as attend racing. And lack of transparency. And we have one person who has signed up to speak and Lori Lucky and she has been admitted to the meeting. Before we take comments from the public, I'd just like to remind um, the speakers that any person making personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks, or who become boisterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the council will be muted and removed. But at this time, we have one person, and Lori, you have the floor. I'm not seeing her. Lori, are you out there? Hmm. Is she unmuted? I'd ask her to unmute. <clears throat> Hello? Lori, I think we've got you. Finally. <laughs> Welcome to our meeting. Uh, yes, I just wanted to present the comments that I also wrote to the city clerk. Uh, some of you have heard from me before. This is about traffic and vehicle noises and music and very loud, uh, unmuffled cars down in Redondo. And I addressed my first comments to... Uh, to the chief or whoever represents the police department at this meeting. Um, we in Redondo feel that we continue to do the work of your police department ourselves. At 825 yesterday evening, there were two cars immediately below our condo building and their licenses were black Mercedes sedan, BSR 8946, black BMW sedan, license BTX 0404, they do the, the loud muffles and the noises 
um, at, right at the corner of Soundview Drive in fifth place where it's very hard for a lot of people to see them. Um, there's also a very loud truck which has um, heavily modified exhaust and a loud stereo that drove through a few minutes later. Also a frequent problem vehicle. It's a black Dodge Ram with red bed liner, license six, I'm sorry, C61639W. Um, what we really need is officers in plain clothes in a plain car and not the, the Des Moines uh, police SUVs to come in and um, run them off our streets with consequences. There is an RCW that responds to this kind of a problem with a fine of up to $500. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you. At this point, we will now move to the city manager's report. And I give the floor to city manager, Michael Mathias. Thank you, mayor. Um, good e afternoon, everyone. Um, the first thing on our list is an opportunity um, to say goodbye to our building official and our assistant building official. Um, Larry Picard has been the building official for many years. Al Biancalana joined us about seven years ago. And um, uh, for some reason, Al was quite excited about leaving, but... Um, <laughs> It's so is Larry, but I, you know, I, I, I'm going to let Susan say a few words um, and then council certainly can, can offer any comments, but um, it has been nothing but a pleasure. I think the energy and the tone of the, the goodbye, the farewell yet from yesterday for the staff provided, um, we were, you know, the, it, it meant so much in the community. We had um, Kevin Anderson from Wesley came by to say thank you. Um, uh, ben Anderson from the theater, same thing. And, and these guys have left their mark in the most positive way possible on our city, on our community, on our evolution of building. Um, and we just want to say thank you so much. And Susan, would you care to say anything? Oh, yes. yes. Thank you, City Manager Matthias. So um, I was thinking about what to say, and um, I first I want to talk a little bit about Al. <laughs> Al is an amazing code professional, and um, and he's also a talented artist. And so we put that up because this is a painting um, that Al did, or I might, might have the terminology wrong, because I have no artistic talent. So it's incredible to me. Um, the talent that Al has in multiple areas. And I think this one is called uh, Into the Sunset. So it's kind of, I'm assuming it's in honor of kind of their, their future in the golf course. <laughs> so, um, but Al has been kind of that, just that steady, um, knowledgeable, helpful person that all of our architects and developers, um, when they have a sticky problem, Al helps them through it. And I think that's one of the things that I've appreciated the most is that he's very creative, not only in the art world, but in the code world, because <laughs> he, he can help them figure it out, you know, and does and has. Um, as well, he's helped to train the next generation so that we are ready um, to, you know, take take over um, and things will continue very well. But I just personally want to thank, uh, and on behalf of the city, um, Al for his, um, his work and his sense of humor and his friendship. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I also I want to talk about uh, Larry. And um, just for context, I, I looked up like what was happening in 1995 when Larry first came to the city and Amazon sold its first book. <laughs> so, and Windows 95 was a thing, um, eBay started. So the world's come a long way and Larry has brought the building department along with it. And that's one of the things that I've appreciated the most about Larry is that a lot of um, technical folks can, can kind of tend to be uh, non-flexible and stuck in the past, but 
Larry was, of course, it was a team effort, but he was the push behind moving us to full electronic submittals and plan review. And um, he has been uh, a great trainer, always had the eye on the future, um, a great recruiter of staff. He always had his eye on an, another person that could fill in when we needed to fill vacancies. So I think that um, both of these guys have left a legacy that um, our community can be proud of. And if you feel safe going into our buildings in Des Moines, it's because of these guys. And I wanted to uh, express that appreciation publicly and thank both of you for your service um, to the city of Des Moines. Thanks, Susan. Mayor, I don't know if any council members would like to comment. Looking for, <clears throat> I, see, I see Deputy Mayor Mahoney and Council Member Nutting. Larry, I just wanted to wish you the best. I think, Al, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was your first home inspection. I think you were on your first day of inspection the day you came to my house. And so it's been a long seven years or so since we did that, but uh, thank you for all you've done for the city. Uh, it's my pleasure, thank you. Council Member Nutting. <clears throat> yes, I, 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 I just wanna wish them both um, being a person in the industry. Um, you guys have a tough job and um, to have the patience to walk people through and get them uh, to the finish line is commendable. Um, Al, I haven't had a chance to have quite the relationship that I do with Larry, but uh, um, I wish you the best. Uh, Larry, thank you for all you've done. Um, it's been, been on the council for eight years. It's been great working with you on the council um, for the last eight years and uh, you know, when I got red tag building my house, uh, we worked through everything and and walked through it, and we're a better a better city today because of some of that stuff. So, uh, thank you so much for what you've done and the contractors you've helped, and I wish you the best. Enjoy retirement. Thank you. Is there any other council member? I would just like to say, not seeing any other hands. Um, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to me because being on the council for as long as I have, I got a lot of, I get a lot of feedback. And the one thing that everyone used to say is, you know, I, well, it was mixed because in the beginning, everybody said, I love those guys. And then every once in a while, somebody would say, I am so angry at those guys. And I said, well, what did you do? I went in and I told them what they were going to do. And they said, I couldn't do it. I said, well, there's probably a reason why you can't do it. And I said, why did you take the approach of going in and saying, this is what I, th I need to do. And this is what I think I need to do to get there. What do you think? And as soon as that happened, the expertise came forward. Larry and Al, I know people who have been um, contractors in this city for a long time, developers in this city for a long time, and all, they all sing your praises. I know that um, you guys took a look at some things in my house when I had uh, work done and everything has been absolutely fabulous. I think we are a safer city. We're a better city because of the, having the two of you. You guys have definitely, as, as Susan Cesar said, you've left your footprint here. I think you've, it's probably bigger than a footprint. I, uh, I mean, all of the buildings that are here, I know that we had issues with some of the very large projects and I have heard repeatedly that if it wasn't for Larry and Al, we wouldn't get it done. And I look at where we are today and I look at where we were um, 12 years ago, if I just look at council experience, but if I look at even before that, having lived here, you guys have made such a difference here. And the quality that you guys have made sure is, has been instilled and the safety practices will live here for a very long time. And I'm very grateful. Um, it's always hard to see people move on because it's bittersweet. You love the work they do for you. You love the, 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 the result. But at the same time, um, you have the right and you should because uh, there's, uh, there are many golf courses to visit or paintings to paint or whatever it is that makes you happy. But 
you spent your whole life working to celebrate and enjoy. And I wish you nothing but the best. You're both a, a couple of class acts and thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm just gonna make one last comment. Yesterday, it was great to see Rex who came down for the, the farewell event. And just so council appreciates that between Rex, Al and Larry, there's approximately a hundred years of experience that's walked out the door in the last year. And we're, we have a lot of confidence, Jamie, Dan, Hop, Ryan, uh, we'll do a great job of picking it up. Um, Susan's, you know, wonderful mentor to everyone. But that's something that really needs to be acknowledged when you lose that much experience. And hopefully they go to other things that they enjoy. And I know they will. But that is, uh, you know, large shoes to fill. And we're going to do everything we can to retain the level of quality that these wonderful people have provided us. Thank you. Okay, moving on. There's an item on consent number three, talks about the North Marina bulkhead, um, essentially award a contract. And one of the things that's always somewhat complicated um, in you know, local government is when you have capital projects that span more than one city council. And that's the case with the bulkhead. Um, so I wanted Andrew to kind of give a brief update on where, where we've been, or Brandon, perhaps, I'm not sure, um, on, you know, kind of where we've been, what's been the process, and what we're asking of council this evening. So with that, Andrew or Brandon. Yeah, thank you, City Manager Matthias. Uh, Bonnie, do you have the slides? Perfect. All right. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Andrew Murgis, the City Engineer, and I'd like to provide you a brief presentation for the North Marina Bulkhead and Restroom Replacement Project, like Michael said, relating to consent item number three. Next slide, please. Just a short history, and many of you have seen this before, the slide, but the North Marina Bulkhead was constructed back in 1979 and the Associated Restroom Facility back in 1980. Both facilities have met their service life and are now exhibiting significant degradation and structural failure, failure hence why we're pursuing a replacement of the bulkhead in the restroom facility. Next slide, please. Uh, to help provide a strategic approach with the design, permitting, construction, uh, the project was segmented into two distinct phases. Uh, and this is just a graphic that shows uh, phase one, which consists of the north bulkhead and a portion of the west bulkhead and the replacement of the restroom. In phase two, completes the west bulkhead, south bulkhead, and the replacement of the adjacent timber breakwater. In that term, phase one and phase two, you'll see that throughout the council packet, as well as a couple of slides coming up. Next slide, please. Uh, currently the project status, the design engineering and per permitting is complete for phase one and phase two. Uh, the project has also been subsequently uh, been advertised for public bids, which opened on May 19th, 2021, so recently. Next slide, please. Uh, about the public bid opening, uh, like I said, it occurred on May 19th uh, with the city receiving two bids, one from Bergerson Construction and the other from Quig Brothers. Uh, each bidder was required to submit two proposals, one for a base bid, as we called it, which includes phase one and phase two construction or the whole formula deal and the second proposal for an alternate A bid, which included just phase one work. Uh, upon submittal review, it has been determined that Bergerson Construction is the responsive low bidder. Next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about the, the funding to date. Uh, the city has received uh, $1.95 million from Washington State that assisted in the completion of <clears throat> the engineering design and environmental permitting including the mitigation credit purchase that we did with Wildlands recently. Uh, and we've expended all of that money for phase one. And recently the city has received another $1.95 million within the 2021 and through 2023 biannual state budget to assist in completing phase two construction. Uh, the commerce contract is expected to be executed by September 
Uh, I started just getting correspondence from the state on that. And uh, hopefully the next few weeks, I'll actually see the contract itself. And just a big thank you to Senator Karen Kaiser, Representative Tina Orwall, and Representative Mia Gregerson for pushing uh, both of these grants over the past, you know, four years since we've been doing this to make this project a reality. Next slide, please. Uh, as illustrated in the consent item, uh, it is recommended that the city award the base bid and complete the entire project, phase one and phase two. And in order to achieve this goal, a financial strategy uh, has been developed to account for a funding shortfall of two, about $2.6 million. This strategy includes reductions in project construction contingency, reduction in internal project management and finance charges, and increases in general fund REIT 1, and one-time B&O tax resources for the project, and a uh, reduction or deferral of for 2021 and 2022 capital improvement plan projects. Uh, and all these are illustrated also in the council uh, packets. We can jump into Q&A on that uh, a little bit now or later on. In the next slide, please. And that's kind of all I had for the brief, brief update, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this point that you may have. Uh, let's see. I see Deputy Mayor Mahoney. And is there anyone else that I, oh, I'm sorry. And I see uh, Council Member Harris. And that's all I see. So I will start with Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Washington Legislative District. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the proposal. Um, appreciate that. Got a couple quick questions. So you're recommending we do phase one and two together for $13,700,000. If we decide to do them separately, what would be the cost if we do them independently of each other? Uh, what I figured out, just estimating, if we did phase two, say about three years from now, there'd probably be an additional $3 million added to the costs, as well as forfeiture of the phase two grant that the state uh, has in their budget currently for phase two. So the least cost is 3 million, maybe more is what you're saying to me. Yeah, yeah, with the three with the three year delay for phase two, we would experience about a $3 million increase in costs and given inflation right now in material shortages, it could go higher than that. I've been looking at about a eight to 15% inflation per year just on construction costs, which I think might be kind of low coming up next year. Okay. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, obviously we've waited two years and some of the issues and delays and additional cost. I know, I think you have an issue with the, the delay on the um, national marine fisheries permit, but can you talk about the price of steel, concrete, et cetera, that would be involved here? Yeah, I mean, as everybody knows, uh, they probably, everybody goes to Home Depot, wood is very, very expensive, and steel right now is also experiencing, uh, you know, supplier shortages and raw material shortages around the world. We're kind of fortunate on this project not to be federalized, so we don't have a Buy America provision, uh, so we can tap into steel sources around the world, but as I've heard from a lot of suppliers and contractors, uh, we're kind of lucky to get in now because it's going to become a uh, thin pickings coming up in the next couple of years. As far as the, the additional costs uh, that came in a little bit above the engineer's estimate, uh, they were still within the 10 plus minus 10%, so not unanticipated, but there are a couple items that did increase the cost. One was, like you mentioned, the environmental permitting. And previously, uh, going through the National Marines Fisheries Service process, we ended up spending about $600,000 additional uh, money just to get through the environmental process and, you know, purchase the mitigation credits and do all the reporting within the contract itself for construction. So that was a big one. Then the, then the additional funds on top of that, I would say are probably just cost escalations, uh, you know, that we're seeing right now, just in that delay with, you know, that two-year delay with, with the federal government at this point in time. And then what was interesting is the National Marines Fishery Service, when they uh, gave us our permit or approval to get the core permit, they released about 40 plus projects on the street. 
And I had a lot of contractors call in and basically say they're overwhelmed with work and they're not going to be bidding projects. So you actually even see uh, a lot less bidders now because there's just too much work on the street for waterfront work at this point in time, given the federal's decision to approve a lot of projects at once in this region. Uh, so yeah, all these I would consider are inflationary factors on why costs are continually going up right now. It sounds like the dam is overflowed. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for those answers. Okay, I will go to Councilmember Harris. And I saw Councilmember Nettings' hand, so I'll go after Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Andrew, is there, a, can you provide any kind of, you know, detail on uh, the uh, CIP project reductions? Um, like, you know, what does this mean for the Barnes Creek Trail? Are we simply deferring that work? out uh, you know, in a couple more years, or are we actually reducing the uh, work on, on these projects? Yeah, so the, the three projects in, in the CIP recommend, recommendations uh, are actually in the council packet for the c consent item. Mm -hmm. uh, and the I'm just trying to look through my notes really quick here to answer the question. Just give you one quick second if you... So like the Barn Street Trail, a lot of the projects uh, were deferred. The Barn Street Trail in particular, what has happened recently is we, we had a right-of-way federal grant to go into right-of-way acquisition this year. And I asked more or less the, the administrators of that money to defer that a year and they approved that. Uh, so we had a little bit of capacity of the REIT money to kind of postpone that and kind of rebuild for getting the project back up and running. So in that one in particular, it's kind of a deferral of action at this point in time, not really killing the project, just kind of pushing it, you know, the can down the road on that one. Uh, the arterial traffic calling one, uh, we are we do have a budget this year for 2021. The proposal is that in 2022, we don't have an arterial traffic calming program and then pick it back up in 2023. So more or less a year break on that program. Uh, the other ones, uh, the 199th to the 200th Safe Routes to School project, that one we applied for grants and didn't receive them. And the money that was slated to be used in 21 and 22 on that project was the matching money for that grant. So since we didn't get the grant, uh, we don't need that expenditure at this time. And we'll con continue to pursue grants for that project in the future. Uh, and there was one more... What was the other one? For some other reason, my Play equipment at the beach park. Oh yeah, the thank, thank you. Uh, the beach park, more uh, bulkhead and play equipment uh, down on the marina floor next to this project. It's just a project that that is a great project for future vision. Uh, I don't think it's high priority right now uh, to get that one going. So we kind of deferred that project into the future as well. Okay, they're 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 on the board for the future. They're not going to just go away because of uh, this. They're you know the the intent is to get these all accomplished at some point. Yeah, you you bet. The the attachment number one in the council packet no. shows those project CIP worksheets and just the reduction per year, but it doesn't request that those projects are eliminated from the CIP. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. That takes us to Councilmember uh, Nutting. And I, before you start, Councilmember Nutting, did, uh, did I couldn't tell if I saw Councilmember Buxton's hand. Is that a yes or a no? That's a no. Okay. So we just go straight to Councilmember Nutting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, Andrew, I just have a, a few. You answered it. Uh, as long as they're on the CIP, we still can uh, apply for grants and matching funds. Um, <clears throat> my second question is, is, um, is there, I, I didn't see it, I might have missed it. Uh, is there a provision in there saying that this is a um, take it, a, a bid that we're getting the materials for what the cost is right now? Um, unfortunately, issues that I've seen and run into over the last several months is that um, uh, suppliers are going back to owners and and GCs asking for more money because of materials and the inflation of materials. So if this bid is awarded, they're not going to come back to us for another million 
$2 million in, in, in material costs because they weren't able to acquire the materials after we award the contract. So right, right, right now, I mean, the bid proposals are what they are. Uh, there are wash dot specifications that kind of control how contractors and agencies work together to solve problems that are outside of our control. Uh, right now, what I know is, you know, I, I can't say it's risk free, but I, I would state that chatting with the con, you know, the responsive low bidder right now is they have a supplier on board and they're just waiting to get their order in like now once this contract's approved. So, so far, I haven't heard anything from the contractor saying they're having a hard time or there's going to be procurement problems coming up. You know, I can't guarantee there isn't going to be anything, but it sounds like they've got a supplier that is waiting for the go ahead on the project. Mm -hmm. If things do come up, there are specifications and in, in contract ways on working through those. And unfortunately, I just I can't speculate right now on what happens if that situation arises. So, OK, so not proc procurement problems, but escalation in material costs yeah i consider that still a procurement issue and honestly on all the contracts i've been on i have not seen that creep up and the bar is usually pretty high with the state specs on having to renegotiate prices that the things that will catch you pretty quick lately in the past couple of years will be uh issues related to uh you know the the pandemic uh when there's mandates on closing plants down, closing facilities down, getting workers at home. Those I think were very, very high risk that caused cost escalations right through the board because no one expected to be paying that. But I expect on this project that, you know, the, the bid prices are what they are. Uh, and, you know, if the contractor can get the material ordered, uh, I don't see very high risk in, in someone coming back and saying, we need to chat about prices. And we'll know that right out of the gate. I mean, if, if that turns into a high risk item, uh, I'll know, you know, we'll know that starting off here on the project. And if there's any big risk that we need to manage with really hard decisions, uh, I will bring that up in, in front of the administration and council if needed. Very good. Uh, please, please. I hope nobody misunderstands that um, this is a very good project. Um, we need it um, for the uh, the bulkhead and for emergency management purposes and just to get it done I, I understand all of that I if if we got to find some storage space for the materials and get it ordered before stuff uh, before escalation happens then I, I just suggest that so that, that's all I have thank you thank you thank you mayor um Andrew, appreciate that. Just a couple of comments. Um, we've had, you know, the benefit of huge amount of support from our representatives in the 33rd, but that's also the 30th. So Representative Taylor, Representative Johnson, Senator Claire Wilson, those two delegations have accomplished so much on behalf of the city, both funding in Redondo and at the, and at the marina. And I just um, can't help but compliment Andrew Brandon as well, and, and, and other people, Scott, Dan, everyone who had to wait through the process of getting the NIMS permit. Um, we had the permit ready from the Corps of Engineers for quite a while, subject to getting the National Marine Fishery Service. That took approximately two years. We had a great deal of cooperation from Congressman Adam Smith's office, and uh, we moved forward, and there were um, requirements uh, that the money would disappear, possibly at least two million of it, if we didn't meet certain deadlines in this summer, and we were able to do that. And Andrew done a great job of uh, both shepherding it through the process and also spending the money in a timely fashion, which uh, we appreciate. So, moving on from there, um, I'd like to to come to our last item, which is the. Police Department, we're going to have Ken, our Chief Thomas, talk a bit about what happened in Olympia. And we're going to have Shannon talk about kind of what the status of COVID preparation and response in the city is 
at this time. So with that, we'll start with the chief. Thank you. Good evening, city manager, mayor, and council. I have a few updates. And the first one is a brief update uh, on the legislative action in Olympia that's most uh, significantly impacting our department. So very briefly, um, you may have heard that there was a tactics law uh, or a tactics bill that was passed and that uh, prohibits chokeholds or neck restraints of any kind, and it significantly limits vehicle pursuits. So we have to have probable cause uh, for a crime of violence or that a sex crime has occurred or reasonable suspicion uh, that a person uh, is under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and, and they pose an imminent threat to the safety of others. So one of the examples given as we're trying to work through on some policy issues is, uh, for instance, if there's a bank robbery and the person has gone in and robbed the bank and taken the money and then they're leaving in the car and they refuse to stop, uh, by following the letter of this law, our officers would not be allowed by state law to pursue that vehicle unless we could show that there's an imminent threat to the community and just committing a bank robbery uh, does not uh, include that as one example. It gets very complex. The next law is use of force. And, and this is also uh, somewhat complicated in the sense that uh, deadly force uh, is only uh, can be used when necessary to protect against uh, an imminent threat of serious injury or death to somebody. That's pretty much what we, we already have. You must exhaust all available and appropriate de-escalation prior to any force and only enough force to overcome the resistance, which then needs to stop immediately. Well, there gets some really complex areas that get in from preventing force to happen in the first place and other issues that, that may or may not be authorized by this new law. Uh, obviously, the duty to intervene uh, is now uh, codified in the law that requires the officer to uh, immediately uh, stop or prevent uh, excessive force and to intervene and then notify their supervisor. The challenge is if you weren't there at the beginning and, and you don't understand that force is being used because the person may have a gun or a knife or another weapon and you jump in and stop that, it could then turn and be used against the officer. And, and if it's an officer from another jurisdiction, their policy may be different than our jurisdiction. There's been a lot of discussion on how to completely and appropriately comply with that law. Um, there's the electronic uh, recordation of custodial interrogation, which requires uh, custodial interrogation of an adult uh, for a felony offense or a juvenile for any offense to be recorded audio and video. So as we've talked about upcoming with the body cameras, uh, according to the um, legal advisors and WASPIC by having body cameras may be the only way to effectively comply with that uh, law. And then of course the state versus Blake, which essentially makes possession of a controlled substance uh, no longer a crime at this point, unless we can show that on two prior occasions, the person's been given an opportunity to get treatment and they've either refused that or failed then they could be prosecuted uh, as a misdemeanor. Uh, my feeling on that is some uh, departments in the, the region are really were, are looking to come up with ways where we can document um, that the person's been offered opportunities for treatment so then they can prosecute for a misdemeanor crime. Uh, my belief on that is I believe the legislature and the uh, in county prosecutor's office at least, has weighed in on the fact that there's not a lot of community support to prosecute and or arrest for very low level um, possession of controlled substance 
cases, so I'm not sure that's going to be a major priority uh, for our department. Uh, quickly moving on, Redondo update. Uh, you heard a little bit this evening at the council meeting on some complaints or concerns uh, from residents at Redondo. I hear about it every single day, as I'm sure uh, many of you do, and, and we take those complaints or concerns uh, very seriously. I can tell you in the month of May, our officers logged over 132 hours of emphasis patrol in Redondo. We wrote 85 tickets and, and gave 83 warnings. And I know I've heard some feedback, Chief, that's nonsense, quit giving warnings. Uh, your guys should just hammer everybody for tickets all the time. And I'm here to tell you, that's no way to run a police department. That, that's no way to uh, have police community relations to create a police state with absolutely no discretion. Our justice system is not set up that way, and that's not the way our officers conduct uh, business. But I will put a little bit of context. Uh, we have spent time in Redondo, but I think also for the month of May, it's important to know that our officers responded to 1,540 calls for service. 191 of those calls were for welfare checks or people uh, involved in crisis, mental health or behavioral health crisis. Over 69 calls were domestic violence related calls for service that uh, required an, an immediate response. We went to 53 traffic accidents last month. We were involved in over 30 auto theft related calls we went to nine shots fired calls, nine assault reports, and three stabbing reports. So in addition to our time at Redondo, uh, our officers also have other uh, crimes and responsibilities to address uh, within our city. Uh, however, we have listened to the concerns about the noise and the, the loud mufflers. Last week, we went out and purchased two noise measuring devices. We're training up our officers and getting them down to Redondo to deploy uh, those decibel meters uh, that meet the, uh, the code so we can write tickets if we have uh, those appropriate violations. Body camera update, uh, as you know, we've hired a consultant. We're continuing to work through the details and the policy uh, to uh, be able to deploy and uh, work with the body camera program to ensure, to, as another measure to help ensure accountability uh, for our police officers. And then finally, uh, on Monday morning, uh, next Monday, I will be on a Zoom call with WASPIC and um, for a peer review on our upcoming grant for the behavioral health co-responder grant application through WASPIC, where we are requesting over $415,000 to help support our department's response to uh, mental health issues. So once again, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Rochelle Sims. She is the one that uh, wrote that grant for, um, for the whole nine cities in South King County that this is gonna support uh, based upon that support that was provided by our city manager to allow us to take the lead in this uh, process. So that is all I have as far as a department update. Thank you, Chief. Um, Shannon, do you wanna kind of bring our council up to date? We sent out an email recently, uh, a memo regarding COVID and the process of you know, reopening. And um, I thought it would make sense for Shannon to kind of update us on, on that process. Thank you, City Manager Mathias. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Shannon Kirchberg, your Emergency Preparedness and Safety Manager. I'm here to update you on the status of city facilities reopening. 
leadership staff has been meeting to establish the city's stay safe reopening plan to reopen all of our city facilities, services, and programs. Currently, as you know, we are closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic and have been since March. Uh, while the, the pandemic has definitely impacted our city operations, we are very proud to say our staff has proven that through innovation, we as a city can be successful and continue to offer exceptional levels of service to our community. As we continue to navigate this pandemic, our priority has been and will continue to be the health and safety of our community members and its employees. In reopening city facilities, the Safe Start Plan and, the, and our four-stage Stay Safe Reopening Plan will guide all of our efforts to welcome our customers as well as our staff back to city facilities. Currently, we're in stage one, so our current state is essential services. We're gonna stay in this state through the July 4th weekend. So critical services have continued uninterrupted while facilities have been closed to the public. Additional essential services have been offered remotely so that we can limit that person-to-person -person contact. Public meetings such as council have been held remotely. Social distancing, face covering, self-health checks, have been required for all employees entering all of our closed city facilities. Heightened and frequent cleaning procedures have been implemented in the facilities and workspaces where essential staff reports to work. Me personally, I have been focusing my efforts on preparing the city facilities for the eventual return to work by our remote workers. So let's talk about phase two, which is our phasing towards normalcy. July 6th through September 6th of 2021 would be this phase. We'd be open to the public with limited hours between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. For individual department information, we would refer the public to the city website. This will give detailed information by department on or before July 1st. So you can go to the website to find out when and how to access other city, all the city departments. Our remote workforce will gradually begin returning to facilities. Not all of the staff is gonna be returning at one time. And hybrid scheduling will be utilized as approved by department directors. Again, our top priority remains the health and safety of our community and our employees. Heightened and proper cleaning of facilities and workspaces is gonna continue. Protocols for entering city facilities will be clearly posted not only for city staff, but also for the public. And a note to everyone, face coverings will be required for employees and visitors, regardless of your vaccination status, till at least stage three of our reopening, of which we anticipate to start on September 7th. Stage three, opening to the public. Business hours are currently to be determined, but we do hope to enter stage three by September 7th. City will reopen all facilities to the public and employees with office hours still out there. We'll, we're going to figure those out as we get a little closer. Social distancing, face coverings, health screens, capacity limits, and, high, and heightened cleaning will continue in accordance with Washington State and Seattle King County public health guidelines. Staff will establish schedules to include hybrid and alternate schedules as authorized by the city manager to support regular business hours. Innovations that have allowed city business to be conducted virtually may remain in place. Stage four, which is our new normal for City Hall, date to be determined, that would be when all city facilities will open to the public with regular office hours without restrictions. Implementations of stage four will be subject to the success of our region and state and its ability to control this pandemic. As a result of the coronavirus pandemic, we do not expect to fully return to pre-pandemic way of operating. We will be implementing our new norm to include permanent changes to work practices, workspace capacity, and normal or hybrid work schedules. Thank you, Shannon. Great summary. Um, I guess the one, it will take any other questions, but I just want to make the comment, the manner in which we're doing this 
Um, not all cities are. Some cities are opening up completely all at once. We're following the lead of a few other larger cities in the hope that everything is under control and there is no more mass infection or spread of the virus. But the manner in which we're doing this protects us in case there is any slippage in addressing the, the virus. We're going in phases and after we accomplish one, then we expand slightly more. We hope to be absolutely back to normal um, by the end of the year, but we will monitor closely everything we're doing. So with that, Council, if there are any questions for Shannon. I see JC Harris and um, I see Councilmember Nutting. And Councilmember Martinelli, did your hand go up or no? Yes, okay. Okay, and I'm sorry, Dennis, did you see another one? No. Okay, so we'll start with Councilmember Harris, go to Councilmember Nutting, and then Councilmember Martinelli. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Shannon, I just have one quick question. Uh, will the South office be open starting in July to accept payments in person? The South side of City Hall? Yeah, the desk. The, you know. I've just had people ask me about, you know, coming in to make payments like for permits and stuff like that. You know. No, we have a drop box for permits out front of the front office. If for any reason somebody does need to come into the building to make a payment, they mm -hmm. can schedule an appointment for a face-to-face -face by calling the office and scheduling at least 72 hours in advance. But we do have a drop box available for them to pay. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also a kiosk there. I do want to note that in August, there will be a time where that south office will be closed permanently due to maintenance. So we're hoping that that won't exceed more than seven to 10 business days. Thank you. Okay, I see Councilmember Nutting. I was just hoping that we could uh, get a copy of the phases that you have. Um, so if we have any questions that we could answer them or refer them to the proper people. Absolutely. Uh, we will get that mailed out tomorrow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. And then uh, Council Member Martinelli. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I want to thank Shannon and Michael for putting this plan forward. I think it's, it's appropriate and it's a safe approach. My question would be, um, you stated that Masks are required at City Hall and city properties, regardless of vaccination. Um, does that not apply to the dais and the mayor, um, or does that just apply to city employees, or is there some exemption for the mayor who's at City Hall at the moment? This is our state safe start plan for reopening. So this for right now, um, in city council chambers, the mayor where you see him and Bonnie where you see her, where they might be close together on your screen, I can promise you. They are uh, very far apart. Uh, thank you. Although I did just see somebody behind um, one of them, but th but that's fine. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, that takes us back to Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. That um, concludes um, our the C manager's report. Thank you very much. Okay, and that takes us forward to the consent calendar. Will the clerk please read the consent calendar? Item one, approval of vouchers. Item two, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, Pride Month pro proclamation. Item three, North Marina parking lot bulkhead and restroom replacement project, public works construction contract award, and consultant contract supplement, supplemental agreement number five, item four, 24th Avenue pipeline replacement slash upgrade project. Item five, 2021 Des Moines Farmer Market Agreement. And that concludes the consent calendar, Mayor. Uh, I see Council Member Nutting. Is there a motion to approve the consent, account, consent calendar? So moved. Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Is there any council member that wishes to remove an item? Council member Harris. 
Uh, yes, item five, please. Item five, okay. Seeing no other hands, okay. We will be voting on items one, approval of vouchers, two, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual proclamation, item three, North Marina parking lot bulkhead, item four, 20th, 4th Avenue pipeline replacement. Um, okay, all those in favor of items one through four, please raise your hand and keep it up until I call your name. Okay, I see Councilmember Bangs, Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Martinelli, Council, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, and myself, and I'm sorry, and Councilmember Harris. Okay, that passes 7 0. And um, we now we will go back to um, item number five the 2021 Des Moines Farmers Market Agreement. Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just have a simple question. Uh, regarding the financial impact, it says that um, basically the city is uh, reducing, the, if I get this right, the normal $35,000 fee down to $100 for the second year in a row. Um, am I correct in that? Are you to city manager? Yes. Okay. And um, how, how was that decision arrived at? Did the uh, did the board of the market approach the city, or did you did the administration decide to offer that? So some of the 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 basic premise here is that the farmers market is an invaluable part of the city, and plays a critical role in multiple ways. And about four years ago, we started looking at the way the city um, was interacting with the market financially. And we started um, reducing their lease rates, um, giving them costs related to storage of their materials and the dry sheds. Um, and there were a number of other, a number of other factors. One of them being a stormwater grant we get from the county that we were able to redirect a large portion of that to the to the farmers market. And I have to tell you, the way that started was I met Wayne Corey at Anti Irene's for a discussion about the market, and he said, "Oh, I've got I've got some papers in my in the trunk of my car. Come sign these." And so going along with Wayne, I signed the papers, which gave them about $15,000 of this grant. And that's so it became institutionalized in that manner. But we're happy to provide it's in the neighborhood of $15,000 annually. Um, we continued the practice of working on of re reducing their lease rates to what you describe um, and providing um, in kind services. Uh, which probably total somewhere in the neighborhood of around $50,000 total to help the market be successful um, with great respect for their ability to deal with situations. But this year with COVID and some of the other constraints, we wanted to assure their success to the degree as a city we are able. So we've moved forward in that direction. Whether that was ever laid out in a piece of paper, as I just described it, that essentially is what's occurred. Uh, so one one last thing. So um, they have not indicated to you that they anticipate a reduction in traffic or their you know revenues from the public. Um, you know they're expecting business to be good this year, correct? Or or they're you know concerned about that. Well, I'm going to defer to um, Councilmember Buxton. I think who's our representative on the farmers market. I think they've done a remarkable job of maintaining their ability to operate and functional and remain functional and remain well populated by, by people who love the market. So Councilman Buxton, do you wanna to add to that? Sure, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm still not exactly sure the source of the question. The market runs pretty much, they, it's a well run, but it's run on a shoestring and everybody who's paid is underpaid because they believe in what they're doing. 
And so if the market were to get any extra money, uh, uh, they would they would spend it on staff at this point. Um, they need more help. They need more volunteers. It, the as far as I'm aware, this hundred dollars has been there since before I was elected. Before the market board president was even there, so I'm not even exactly sure when this hundred dollars was established. But at least before Kim was there, before I've been here. So they've just carried it forward. It, and, oh. Okay. All there I is a is... lot of, re just, just let me finish. There is, there are some, I want to be very careful to preserve dignity, but I do, re do understand that there are records not available to the current board because some things were, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, and, I, but the, okay. so, <laughs> all I wanted to know was, did somebody from the board come to the city and say, you know, we're concerned that sales might be down this year? That's all. Not this year. Groovy. Thank you. Done. Let's vote. Well, I do think it's important to note, and Councilmember Nuttings raised his hand. I'm going to jump in here a little bit is that the um, farmer's market has fewer vendors. Um, at its peak, it was somewhere around 4,000 to 5,000 people in a day, and it had many more vendors, which it does not have today. Uh, I was down there last week, and they actually are having to control the amount of people that they can allow into the market, and they do have fewer vendors. I think the number of folks coming through, and I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere we're in the vicinity of, of 2000. Uh, does that sound correct? Uh, yeah, and I think, yeah, Deputy Mayor and Councilmember Buxton are, are agreeing. Um, uh, so what I, my point is that it is a smaller market. We, I think the gesture of the city to help them grow back to where they were, understanding the impact that this market has on this community is absolutely uh, well thought out. And I applaud uh, City Manager Mathias's efforts there. And with that, I will go to council member noting. I have a comment and then I'm gonna make the motion. Um, <clears throat> there are other farmers markets that are struggling. And then you go to Snohomish that are farmers markets that have never shut down during the pandemic. Um, we have this market, it has grown and grown and grown and last year was a hit to them and still everybody stepped up to make this thing succeed so um in that i make the motion to approve the agreement with the des moines farmers market for 2021 waterfront market to be held in des moines marina saturdays from june through october and other market days throughout the year may be approved by the city manager and authorized by the city manager to ex execute the agreement substantially in the form attached. Second. Okay, I have a motion made and a second by Councilmember Buxton. Councilmember Harris, you have a final comment? Yes, I just wanted to thank you. That was extremely helpful, uh, the stats that you provided. That's it. Okay, all those in favor of the motion as read, uh, please raise your hand until I call your name. I see Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Bangs, Councilmember Buxton, myself, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, uh, Councilmember Martinelli, and Councilmember Harris. This uh, passes 7 0. And that completes our consent agenda. At this point, I will read the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Questioning Pride Month proclamation into the record. Now, therefore, the Des Moines City Council hereby pro proclaims June as Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Questioning Pride Month and encourage all people in our state to join in celebrating diversity and promoting inclusion and equal protection under the law and further encourage people to join us in eliminating discriminatory policies and practices towards any culture, rate, or group. Okay. That takes us forward to our first new business item, 
which is the Wyra 9 Salmon Habitat Plan 2021 update and adoption uh, staff presentation with our engineer manager, uh, Mr. Lauren Reinhold. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Lauren Reinhold, Surface Water Manager. I'll be turning us over to Matt Goering, the Salmon Recovery Manager for the Wyra 9 Watershed. And Matt has a 10 to 15 minute presentation on the 2021 Salmon Habitat Plan update. And then afterward in your packet starting on page 117 for your consideration is a draft resolution for ratifying the plan. So with that, uh, Matt Goering. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that uh, and hear me okay? All right, great. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about salmon recovery efforts in the Green Duwamish and Central Puget Sound watershed including the recent RAN 9 Salmon Habitat Plan update. Um, my name is Matt Goring. I'm the Salmon Recovery Manager for the Watershed, and I'm excited to share with you the salmon recovery efforts going on in our watershed, and also want to thank you for your continued support of RAN 9. So Puget Sound Chinook have experienced a sustained decline over the last 150 years. The image on the right traces this decline, through the arrival of the Northern Pacific Railroad. The decline culminated in 1999 with the listing of Chinook under the Endangered Species Act. In response to this listing, the state created a structure for local watershed-based organizations to provide the backbone for salmon recovery efforts across our state. So um, really these organizations, such as RIA 9, help bring together diverse interests to help build local support for salmon recovery. In 2001, the 17 local governments in the Green Duwamish and Central Puget Sound watershed came together and entered into an interlocal agreement to support salmon recovery. The ILA recognized that salmon uh, crossed many jurisdictional boundaries and ultimately salmon recovery would depend on a collective commitment across the watershed. The Raya 9 partnership supports a powerful collective voice as well as a cost share structure that provides a unique sustainable funding source for ongoing recovery efforts in the watershed. The original plan was developed in 2005 and was ratified by all 17 local governments. This plan has served as our uh, watershed blueprint for salmon recovery over the last 15 years. And during that time, the ILA has re been renew renewed several times. So Ryan 9 salmon recovery efforts really are nested in a larger regional uh, scope. Green River Chinook are one of 12 or 22 individual populations of Chinook within Puget Sound, and the Raya 9 watershed is considered a local chapter in the regional Puget Sound Chinook Salmon Recovery Plan. And then looking even wider, Puget Sound salmon recovery efforts are really just one component of the larger efforts to restore uh, Puget Sound as captured in the action agenda. So as you know, Raya 9 is a really diverse landscape. The watershed spans uh, approximately 575 square miles, ranging from uh, the industrial waterfront along the Duwamish Waterway, all the way up to US Forest Service lands along the crest of the Cascade. The watershed-based kind of approach allows a holistic view uh, of identifying limiting factors and prior prioritizing projects across the watershed to ensure we're investing in the largest benefits for recovery. The Raya 9 staffs a watershed ecosystem forum which oversees the Raya 9 work program and has de decision-making authority for operational budgets, funding recommendations, and planning initiatives. The forum includes representation from across the watershed, including represent representatives from the 17 local governments. And I wanna thank the mayor as well as Lauren Reinhold for their engagement on this forum. So since its inception, the Raya 9 construct has been successful in securing local, state, and federal funding with approximately $200 million now of investments uh, since 2000. 
Partners have realigned over two miles of levees to reconnect floodplains, restored uh, more than 4,500 feet of marine shorelines, and revegetated over 500 acres of land. The picture on the right, um, some of you may recognize, but that's Seahurst Park, a before and after, a two-phase restoration park in Vir or project in Virian. This restoration involved almost uh, three quarters of a mile of beach restoration. The project still stands today as one of the largest shoreline restoration projects in Puget Sound, and this is a demonstration of how we can balance restoration with multiple, multiple use objectives in an urban setting. And so I wanna thank the city of Des Moines for their long-term support. Over the last 20 years, ILA cost share partners have collectively contributed $8.4 million to the program. And this significant investment has helped build our collaborative partnership and position the, part, the watershed for the success we've been able to achieve. Uh, so this chart just shows annual uh, Chinook salmon returns since 1990. The green line depicts uh, wild fish and the blue line depicts total fish, including hatchery origin fish. You can see that despite the progress that I just went through, uh, we really haven't seen a significant rebound in Chinook. And following the ESA listing, Chinook numbers dropped to a really alarming level in 2009. We had less than 200 fish return to uh, the Green Duwamish watershed. And although the numbers have increased uh, since then, numbers in five of the last 10 years have been below the short-term goal of 1,000 to 4,200 Chinook. Unfortunately, this trend isn't really unique to Rye 9 and can be seen across Puget Sound. And it highlights the need to accelerate and amplify our work. So fast forward to today, uh, the Salmon Habitat Plan update represents the next chapter of our salmon recovery in our watershed. The update process really val validated the strength of the original 2005 plan. And as a result, the update really is more of a series of, of tweaks and uh, adjustments as opposed to a comprehensive overall. And by incorporating new best available science, it helps provide an updated science-based framework for identifying, prioritizing, and implementing salmon recovery actions over the next 10 to 15 years. The plan contains policy and programmatic actions. Uh, these strategies range from protecting and restoring marine shorelines to expanding uh, public outreach uh, to hopefully uh, uh, help with behavior change initiatives. It also contains an updated capital uh, project list, which includes 108 conceptual capital project ideas. These conceptual projects were developed in concert with our local partners. Um, and finally, the plan contains a, a, a uh, a plan to support regular assessment of progress and to inform continual adjustments to ensure we continue to ma maximize the return on our investments. So this slide just portrays the life cycle of the Chinook salmon in relation to the five sub-watersheds in Raya 9. The city of Des Moines lies squarely in the marine nearshore wa watershed that extends from Elliott Bay down through Federal Way. As juvenile Chinook leave the Duwamish and enter the marine nearshore, they rely on the shallow marine waters along the shoreline for critical rearing and refuge habitat before heading out to the ocean. And this kind of shallow shoreline habitat also provides important spawning habitat for small forage fish, uh, usually about three, four inches in length that are important prey items for salmon. So the plan update outlines a variety of recommendations and conceptual projects within the marine nearshore. Programmatic and policy recommendations largely focus on uh, reducing the impacts of shoreline armoring uh, and promoting soft shore stabilization where it's appropriate. These recommendations highlight uh, issues such as sea level rise adaptation and, increased, uh, and an increasing need for technical assistance for shoreline homeowners. The plan uh, outlines 39 individual capital projects within the marine nearshore subwatershed, three of which are located in the city of Des Moines. And although uh, all three of these projects were in the original 2005 plan, I want to thank uh, Lauren for helping uh, us review these and uh, getting them refined for the plan update. So I'm just going to quickly go through them. Um, McSorley Creek, uh, this is located in Saltwater State Park. 
And as you can see here in red, there, you know, the shoreline is heavily armored with rock riprap. And uh, the conceptual idea is to restore 1,100 feet of shoreline and the associated pocket estuary of the small creek in Puget Sound. This project has already received some grant funding and is currently in the design process. And this, this next picture I just wanted to share with you uh, is, is some pretty cool resor results that were actually found in the last uh, couple months of sampling. Uh, crews have been out uh, doing baseline sampling in the creek and it, it's pretty exciting to see the range of fish that are actually continuing to utilize this, uh, this creek even in its current shape including juvenile Chinook as shown in those uh, two fish on the lower right. The next project I just wanted to overview, provide an overview is Massey Creek. It's another small nearshore stream that flows into Puget Sound just south of the marina. The lower reach of the creek is heavily modified. It makes two 90 degree bends prior to discharging into Puget Sound. The current alignment contributes to flooding concerns and has eliminated the historical estuary habitat. The restoration concept, which is purely just conceptual at this point, is to remove the existing fish barriers and realign uh, portions of the lower creek to restore some pocket estuary habitat. Uh, and then finally, Des Moines Creek uh, at the Des Moines Beach Park uh, flows into Puget Sound just north of the marina and the lower reach of the creek again has been uh, pretty heavily modified and the shoreline contains over 500 feet of armor uh, adjacent to the creek mouth. Again, this is another just conceptual uh, idea at this point, but the idea is to really restore and regrade portions of the shoreline and the lower reach of the creek to help improve fish habitat. If this project was to move forward, obviously any future designs would uh, need to carefully integrate the important recreational interests at this site. So looking forward to implementation, Ryan 9 is committed to working with our partners, including the city of Des Moines, to support plan implementation. Ryan 9 develops an annual funding package to fund high priority actions across the watershed. This package is presented to the Watershed Ecosystem Forum every May for approval. Primary funding sources include cooperative watershed management, grants, um, uh, from the King County Flood Control District, State Salmon Recovery Funding Board funds, and State Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration funds. And Ryan 9 staff coordinates with our partners to kind of to get a good view of uh, out year planning and related capital project needs of our partners and maintains a six year project implementation plan to help plan out those investments. So the Watershed Ecosystem Forum unanimously approved the plan update uh, back in February. And the final step uh, in the update process is again, pursuing uh, local government ratification. Ratification acknowledges uh, that all local government partners support the plan and are committed to working collaboratively to support the plan in implementation. It is not an obligation to uh, implement any specific project on any given timeline. It also acknowledges that salmon recovery is not a standalone initiative. It is inherently linked to other community priorities such as flood risk reduction, stormwater management, and recreation. As such, there are likely op opportunities for multi-benefit projects that should be pursued. And finally, ratification recognizes the plan as an important new source of best available science that should help inform local actions. And so before I open it up to questions from council, I just want to acknowledge the rest of the Ryan 9 staff team. Although we're housed in King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks, we really are the collective staff of the Ryan 9 Watershed Ecosystem Forum and are supported by your ILA cost contributions. As such, I want to emphasize that we stand ready to support the city in advancing your salmon recovery priorities and please don't hesitate to contact me if uh, you have any questions regarding salmon recovery or if we can be of any assistance. So with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and I'll open it up to any questions. I see, I can't, I can't see all council members at this time. So the, I see council member Nutting's hand and I see council member Harris's hand. Um, yeah, we have to, okay. And I see council member Buxton. And okay, I think those are the three. So um, at this point, I will start with Councilmember Nutting. I move to adopt 
draft resolution number 21-032, ratifying the 2021 update to the water resource inventory area, WIRA 9 salmon habitat plan, making our watershed fit for a king. Is there a second? I see Deputy okay. Mayor Mahoney. Okay, and before we go forward, um, I see we had comments by Councilmember Harris, and then we will go to Councilmember Buxton. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you for the presentation. I know I'm asking, yeah, this is a silly question, but is there any way to quantify each of these interventions? All right, in other words, and I know it's silly, but you know, you de-armor a hundred feet of some guy's property and it gets you a hundred more returns in the fall or, you know, pick a number, all right? Is there any kind of science on, you know, relationship between each of these interventions and the results you're gonna get? You know, um, there really aren't any quantitative, uh, you know, uh, connections in terms of if you remove X number of feet of armor and you get this many salmon. Uh, uh, we don't have that level of understanding now. It's more of, um, you know, where we've done this, we see, you know, we see benefits to salmon and we can um, uh, show before and after trends of increased abundance. But uh, the so many factors go into uh, adult returns, including you know, uh, ocean conditions, as we've all heard about the blobs in recent past and um, the algae blooms. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to tease out kind of the individual um, uh, uh, efforts, if you will. There's just so much, so many factors, so much noise, it's hard to separate. Thank you. I, I knew I was asking a silly question. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Buxton. Thank you. Uh, interesting presentation, Matt. Thank you for that. I'm all for whatever we can do to help our salmon increase as they return. I had a couple questions. There was a mention about soft armoring. I was wondering if you could clarify that a little bit and what kind of projects or areas would qualify for soft armoring. And then subsequent questions to that, does saltwater qualify? Does any project in Des Moines qualify? And how does Raya 9 work with compromised private property as a result of the work that gets done? Um, it's all connected. All my questions are connected with the saltwater project. Yeah. Um, so soft armoring, as I mentioned, is, is not necessarily appropriate everywhere. Um, soft armoring involves things like uh, placing large woody debris or, uh, you know, uh, gravel berms and things like that that can serve uh, kind of to help protect shorelines, but also um, provide an increased level of function. If you look at it as kind of a spectrum, right, a kind of solid seawall like on the Seattle waterfront is kind of the one end of the spectrum and then a perfectly natural beach um, uh, the other side. And so what you're looking for is, uh, you know, trying to move the needle from one, you know, more towards the natural. Certainly you're not gonna get, uh, you know, uh, to the natural, complete natural in most locations. Uh, the slide I showed you on um, Seahurst Park, a lot of that, if, uh, I wonder if I can go back here. Um, a lot of that is actually uh, considered soft shore uh, armoring. And there's actually been debates over, um, uh, should we still consider this armored or not um, in sections? Uh, but the reality is when you look at it, um, I mean, it not only, uh, you can see that it's, it's improved habitat and it's also improved uh, uh, access. You can see just looking at it that wouldn't you rather go, uh, you know, play and uh, uh, have fun on the, the beach in the lower picture. So that's really, um, you know, and these, these solutions are not one size fits all. Uh, it's really, these have to be tailored to 
the particular landscape. And when you look at Saltwater State Park, uh, you know, I'm well aware, uh, you know, there, there are homes very close to the edge of that cliff on the north, uh, north side of that bluff. And, um, you know, the design team uh, that's being led through King County right now and King County and state parks are uh, in the middle of working on an MOU for that. Um, but, um, you know, we've had a discussion uh, actually, uh, I think just last month, month with Lauren regarding, uh, you know, there are concerns at the city of Des Moines regarding what, what are the implications for those pro properties. And uh, we conveyed those to the design team and they, they've actually invested in geologic studies and uh, they wanted me to convey that they are happy to come to either full council or a council committee um, and show you what they've learned and look at uh, some options. So that's at the forefront of their mind of, you know, that concern is there. And for any of these projects um, that I went through, there are significant constraints. There are hur hurdles to every one of these projects. And if we're gonna get them done, we need local support. You know, the reality is nothing's gonna get done without local supports. And we gotta work through those concerns and see if we can address them. And you know what, at the end of the day, out of those 118 projects in the in the plan or 39 in the near shore, some of those aren't gonna be possible and we aren't gonna be able to overcome some of those hurdles. And that's why I emphasize that most of these are conceptual in nature and meant to be identify and flag them as potential opportunities. So when we make decisions uh, collectively down the road, we at least know what opportunities we may be foregoing or what opportunities uh, you know, may be an option. So it's really just kind of putting it out there and uh, uh, having a record of where these best opportunities are in our watershed. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does. And so, so I'd like to clarify then by, by voting in favor of this today, uh, I'm assuming that I'm not relinquishing our ability to advocate on behalf of our residents down there. Just a absolutely not. And uh, okay. nothing in ratification of the plan uh, commits any jurisdiction to implementing any of these projects. And, uh, you know, the the Saltwater State Park is a unique situation. It's it's complicated because it's state park within the city, and um, you know, I to to be a hundred percent honest, I don't I don't think it was necessarily launched in the right way, and uh, there should have been more outreach up front. And uh, we you know we've recognized that, and uh, you know we've re relayed that loud and clear uh, to the design team. So like I said. Uh, um, you know, as, as they get further along in design or, you know, sooner, if you want, uh, I'd be happy to uh, orchestrate that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. You've yeah. answered all my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to add, Matt, I really appreciate the fact that you guys have acknowledged and are trying to come up with solutions uh, that, that pertain to the challenges of Saltwater Park. Uh, as long as I've been on the council, I have advocated my concern uh, and, and, and advocated for those homeowners and wasn't sure it was heard um, all the time, but I feel today that it has been heard. And um, I, I look forward to wherever it can go. And I appreciate you saying that in some cases, this may not work. And so I, I think that's a very honest approach and I really do appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that. Council Member Nutting, did you have any comments you wanted to make before we went forward with the vote? No, I just I just appreciate it, Matt, that um, just to echo Mayor Pinas, um, to have a state park in your city is crazy and how we patrol that and it's a state park and should be patrolled by state um, uh, uh, the anyways <clears throat> it's thank you for understanding how that goes so that's that's all i have it's it's tough to have a state park in your city and to have to take care of that Okay, well, at this point we have the motion on the table. So I'll ask, 
All those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Okay, Council Member Buxton, Council Member Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, uh, Council Member Harris, Council Member Martinelli, and myself. This motion passes six to zero. Council, uh, Council Member Bangs has uh, excused herself from the meeting. She is not feeling well. So let the record show that Council Member Bangs has left and did not participate in this vote, but it did, did pass six zero. So please, uh, I'll ask the city clerk to include that on the record and I hope she feels better soon. Okay, motion passes and that takes us to introductions of, of items potentially for future consideration. Are there any items a council member wishes to bring forward today? Council member Harris. Yeah, this is really very simple. Um, so, you know, obviously we have been um, recording the uh, committee meetings. Um, I don't know when it started, but you know, I'm assuming that it's been going on all along. Um, and I would just uh, move that we uh, put those up on the uh, YouTube site. They are extremely valuable. They have presentations and information that you know the public asks me about all the time. So if they're available, I you know I would like to make them public. Uh City Manager Matthias, do you have any input on that or? Well, Mayor, just a point of clarification, maybe yourself or the city attorney. So my, my understanding is that um, the council would decide if the issue raised by council member Harris would go on a future agenda as opposed to the decision at this time. I'm just, just for, just so for consistency and, and clarity. Yeah, I will yield to our city attorney, uh, George, uh, Tim George, but that is the, um, th that is what this part of the agenda is about. Yes, that's correct. This is for motions for items on a future agenda. You, you make an excellent point. Yes, I would like to see that uh, on an, future agenda and basically the idea is that any recordings that have been made and any uh, meetings going forward since they are being recorded uh, shall be put on the uh, YouTube site and um, yeah. So is there a second to move this uh, forward? I see uh, city man, uh, let's see, I see Deputy Mayor Mahoney and I see Councilmember Martinelli. Okay, so we have three that would like to see this on a future agenda. I will work with the city manager to get it up there. The one thing that I would like to, um, I don't know if it's a modification, but it's something that I'd like us to consider is that uh, I, you're, you are correct that when we are, while we are in the mode that we are in and we are Zooming, um, that we are recording these meetings. Mm -hmm. Not all of our conference rooms have the same recording capabilities and I'm not sure where that's at. So I think the motion when it comes forward for discussion by council should also include that we find the funds to put the recording equipment in the conference rooms so those meetings can remain consistent from the point that they are released as the city transitions through thing, through its phases, um, assuming that uh, the council does approve it at a future time. Council Member Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, your point is well taken. I was explicit in splitting this out simply to, you know, the Zoom phase. Um, if, you know, my colleagues, you know, agree to put the other, uh, you know, future recording to gang them together, that's fine, but um, I would not want, you know, even if we can't find a way technically to, uh, I, I wanted to keep the ideas separate because even if we can't find a way to do it technically with the conference room, I would still want those existing Zoom meetings on the website. Does that, that make sense what I'm saying? It does make sense. And so how about the idea where we come forward with two motions? One is to get the existing Zoom message, messages or meetings out there. The other is to um, 
look at the technology and the conference rooms to see if uh, future meetings can be recorded and added to that. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so um, if it looks like we have support for that, the city manager and I will um, work forward with that. I see Deputy Mayor Mahoney's hand. I just sharing my support. I think breaking it into the two individual um, motions is probably best as you, as you define there. Thank you. And I think I saw uh, Councilmember Netting's hand. Yeah, I'm just agreeing with that. Okay. And so then, we can move forward. Thank you. And then I see uh, City Manager Mathias. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, Mayor, I would suggest as we're trying to do this, that we get, get this at least on the last meeting in July, so that if there's a decision to expend resources, we can include those in the budget. Okay. I, I, I have no argument with that. Okay. And um, I, uh, okay, I see Council Member Buxton, before I recognize you, I just wanna look at our attorney and, um, uh, City Attorney George, you've heard the separation, so you'll work to make sure that that gets uh, separated as as we intended. Yeah, so we have three, at least three council members, so I think we're good. We, we'll put this on an agenda, and we know what we need to research, and we'll bring it forward to you. Okay, thanks. And uh, Council Member Buxton, you had a comment? Oh, just I when I come to the table, I just want to know. What, what are all the pros of doing this? What are the cons of doing this and how much? So that, that's what I'm gonna wanna know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for adding that uh, detail. That will be in the plan that uh, city manager Matthias, our city attorney, Tim George, and uh, I believe our uh, city clerk and communications director, uh, Bonnie Wilkins will work on as they work through that. Um, Council member Harris. Yes. One minor detail. I don't know when this recording began. Um, you know, maybe some of my colleagues do, but um, I would just like the motion to include, you know, that all prior recordings um, from when they began um, would be part of that uh, motion. So that's all. That, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I believe it's when we started Zooming. Cool. Thank you, Matt. No, it's not. Oh, wow. Okay, um, we'll, we'll get that answer uh, for, the, for the exact start date. I, I misspoke and I'm gonna take that one off the record. Well, it's on the record now, but I misspoke. So I'll let the staff figure out what it is and they'll let us know. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so at this point, We'll go to board and committee reports. And tonight we will start with council member. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, mayor, point of order. We got to take a vote on how that moves forward. Actually, we did it's, not vote. Uh, we, this is just to provide direction. So the city manager has, we have three per council rule. We have three people that have agreed they would like to see it on a future agenda. The city manager has articulated that uh, he's targeting um, the, towards the end of July. And so um, we're covered there, I, I believe. I'll okay. check with our city attorney to make sure that I'm correct. Yeah, that's kind of the process we've set up for these specific items. So we're good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Nope. No apologies. Thank you for uh, making sure we're staying on the right path. Okay. Um, with council board and committee reports and council member comments, we start tonight with. Uh, Councilmember Harris. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so, um, you know, we well, yeah, uh, we have received, you know, all, all kinds of. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So, Chief Thomas, I just wanted to uh, to to uh, applaud what something that he said. You know, the goal is to provide public safety, not to um, you know unduly punish people. Um, so whatever it takes to get, you know, the speeding and the noise in a particular neighborhood solved, you know, that's, that's fine. If it's the thousand dollar fine, great. If it's, you know, giving people a gift certificate to Amazon, whatever. Um, 
And uh, thank you for that. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that um, the, the thing is, the reason that the people in Redondo are getting attention is because they have, to a certain extent, been able to organize and provide a healthy amount of pressure to the city. Um, you know, policing and traffic projects, they're technocratic, they're, you know, we, we try to deal with things according to priority, but the truth of the matter is, is that if your neighborhood has any kind of issue, um, you are far more likely to get attention if you are able to get your neighbors um, on board with the idea. Um, I, I'm sure we all get comments every, you know, in letters every week saying, you know, I want you to do something. And then, you know, the, the resident will get disappointed. You know, they think, well, hey, you know, job done. And it's like, no, man, you got to get like 20 people engaged. Okay, you have to demonstrate that you want your crosswalk or your increased police presence. Um, the, you know, and that's democracy. You got to organize and demonstrate that your neighborhood, your project, um, you know, deserves that added attention. I, I'd like to say that, you know, paying your taxes is enough, but um, uh, there's a certain amount of friendly competition that goes on because every city has limited resources. So it's just worth the thought. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Councilmember Harris, I'd like to add to those comments, if I may. We are an analytics-driven um, uh, police department, and so they they use the 911 input from citizens to focus their patrols. And I think it's important for people to realize that when you are seeing crimes and problems, it's not just about getting together and being a loud voice. It's you know call for policing when policing is needed and make sure you get on the analytics radar. That will get them to focus their patrols. They do listen, they do care, but you're right. They have an entire city to police and there's issues throughout the city. So um, I just think it's important that people understand that it's not just about getting together, it is about calling when you need service because there is a problem. Yeah, I just, just you know, 10 seconds, yeah, because so often people will say, I hate to complain. And I try to tell them, no, you think of it as reporting, okay? They have to have that input in order to have the stats. And so that's it, thank you again. Thank you. The next is uh, Councilmember Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So tonight the Human Services Advisory Committee meeting met and they were still uh, in their meeting when our council meeting started, but uh, we welcomed a new, uh, a new advisory council member, Diane Hoyer. That was nice to meet her. And then um, we re we're receiving a report out from El Centro de la Raza and the Asian Counseling and Referral Services, both agencies which we support through our Human Services Advisory Committee. And glad to have them in today. Uh, also attended the, uh, a ribbon cutting, another new great business in our community, the Organic Blend. It's down over by b &A Meats. And that was a really great festive, uh, festive event. Appreciated being able to be there. So I hope everybody can go uh, check it out. Monday was flag day and the 4th of July is coming up. So there is an interesting little uh, month long event going on in town right now called the running of the flags. And you can find it out on Destination Des Moines and also out on Facebook. And uh, so there are several people that have signed up. I'm going to try to run a hundred miles this month, but I'm halfway there. So I'm uh, hoping to finish up and speaking of running, uh, we have we have a really great thing going in Des Moines in our park. It's called Park Run. It's part of a global running community. They have a five free 5K every Saturday all over the world, and we have one down at the beach park. So starting up this week on Saturday morning at 9 a.m., and then you can run, walk, or push your kids in a stroller and then head out to the farmer's market. So that's happening now all summer long. 
And one more thing I wanted to do here. Let's see. Bear with me for just a moment. Happy birthday, Des Moines. So today is Des Moines, birth Des Moines, Des Moines birthday because I don't say the S at the end of Des Moines. Uh, 62 years old today. So happy birthday, Des Moines. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Martinelli. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank the Chief and Shannon for the reports they gave earlier. Those were those were useful. I also want to thank our police department for putting up both the gay pride flag as well as the Juneteenth flag. I think that those are small gestures, but those are the type of gestures that really help, uh, you know, bring some some community. Uh, they, they're really good for the community to see. Um, I also uh, had a comment in regards to the farmers market agreement. Uh, I think that the farmers market is invaluable to the community. So I respect and understand why uh, administration would want to offer such a discounted fee. Um, my thought would be that it's such a drastic drop from that 35,000 to 100 that unless the market wasn't able to operate, if they were charged this amount, I think it would be great for future consideration to maybe charge five or 10,000 and have that go towards the community good. For example, maybe take that money, donate it directly to the food bank or donate it directly to our human services budget. Uh, essentially just something that could help the community rather than just axing out the fee, the fee pretty much entirely. Um, I also want to thank Council Member Harris for putting forth the, the motion to record um, or to publish the committee recordings and thank Deputy Mayor Mahoney for supporting that. Um, you know, as I've mentioned multiple times, I think it's incredibly important. It seems like a small thing, but as it is right now, if someone works a nine to five job, they have absolutely no means of watching our committee meetings at all. So this, this would allow our community, our working community members to actually watch these committee meetings. Um, and finally, I actually had a new business item that I was gonna put forward. Uh, the mayor moved on before I was able to, which is fine. I will introduce it at the next meeting, but I would like to see us place a ban on facial recognition software. Um, I have spoken Sorry, I've spoken with uh, the, the chief and the city manager and they both stated that we do not use this type of um, software as, as, as it currently stands. And I think that's great, um, but you know, things change and I just wanna make sure that that's codified. Um, for those who don't know, the county just recently placed a ban on this software, but it doesn't apply to the cities. Uh, just a quick uh, quote from uh, council member Jeannie Colwells on why she supports this. Uh, the use of facial recognition technology by government agencies poses distinct threats to our residents, including potential misidentification, bias, and the erosion of our civil liberties. The use or misuse of these technologies has potentially devastating consequences, which the new ordinance will help to prevent. Uh, I would like to just see us take that ordinance that's on the county level, apply it to the city level so that these type of softwares cannot be used under any circumstances. Uh, and that's all the comments I have for today. Thank you. Councilmember Bangs is not here, so we will go forward to Councilmember Nutting. Uh, first off, I just want to say that I'm I'm proud that we can support the farmers market. Um, it's been incredible um, in our community. There are people I've run into Annie Irene's um, grandmother, mother, and daughter that purposely come over to Des Moines to go to get their nails done, go to the farmer's market, and then have dinner in the town. So it's amazing. Farmer's market support it wholly. Uh, second of all, um, thanks, for thanks to staff for all they've done with uh, uh, the bulkhead and everything else. Um, and then the third thing is, is I just want to wish my uh, youngest a uh, happy uh, 13th birthday. Um, as she's out there celebrating with the wife and uh, oldest, I'm here in council and uh, happy birthday, Lila. Number 13, she became a teen today. So thank you so much. Deputy Mayor Mahoney, boy, a 13-year-old birthday, that's a tough act to follow. 
my wife just had a birthday, but uh, I'm not going to put any numbers on it because I like to live. Um, sorry, I love you, baby. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, just another thing about the farmer's market that uh, a lot of people don't know is a lot of people with food insecurity actually get fresh vegetables down there, and it's a great service as well. So I just uh, wanted to add that as, as another service it provides the community. I did a couple of transportation meetings. Um, I went to the Gateway Executive meeting. We talked about 169 and 509 and the and the uh, little bit of shortfall in the funds, the local contributions there. Um, but we're working on ways to cover the gap. But looks like the projects are a go. And skateboard, we had a Nina Collier, and she talked about the national, the transportation packages at the federal level and the negotiation between the House and Senate and the earmarks and so forth. A uh, very interesting conversation. The good news is we're well represented by Pat, by Senator Patty Murray and some of our reps in the House. So I'm optimistic about what the state's going to get. It's going to be interesting what, what the state gets to see what we might get. Um, and then I attended another meeting with Kim, Kim Wyman that talked about voter fraud. And I can tell you guys the hacking and the ways they have to do security is phenomenal, but it, it assures me our voting is um, accurate and safe. But it goes to as simple as to verify the information. One of the things they do is take a flash drive of the information before it's sent over electronically, and then they verify the two to make sure there's not been a hack in between. It was uh, quite interesting. We already talked about the organic blend. Jenna there has a great story um, getting through COVID, and you should patronize her as for sure. A patronage, I think is the, maybe the word. Um, I want to remind people on Saturday, June 19th at the Big Catch Plaza, wear your masks and keep your distances, but we're going to do a downtown cleanup. I want to thank uh, City Clerk uh, Bonnie Wilkins for helping facilitate some of the resources for that. And um, the last one I had was um, I wanted to ask Michael if maybe Andrew could get in here because we heard several comments about the Woodmont Corner. And I know in recent times, maybe some things have been done and there's intent for some in the future, or maybe it's Brandon, I just saw him come on. Could you talk about that just a little bit for us, please? And then with those comments, I'll be done. Go ahead, Brandon. Or Andrew, right. whoever. Yeah, I think Andrew is gonna go okay. ahead. You know, I'll, I'll clean it up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Councilmember Mahoney. Uh, yeah, the city engineering staff has been in a communication with the Woodmont community, I'd probably say over the past uh, two to three months concerning the, the corner at the intersection of Marineview Drive, Woodmont, and uh, South 265th. And uh, we've been taking incremental steps in uh, listening to the public on their concerns. I know there's been a couple accidents recently out there uh, that kind of catches everybody's attention. And we're trying to be programmatic as far as what we can do to help solve some of the problems we, we observe out there. We've done a couple of speed and volume studies out there to get some data to kind of figure out what are the issues. And then uh, we've implemented in May some uh, new signs out there. We've used uh, raised pavement markers from rumble strips on Review Drive on the southbound lane to try to provide kind of a soft rumble strip without making too much noise to the adjacent property owners out there. We've also added some reflective strips along the guardrail uh, on the corner out there to kind of increase the visibility of the corner. Now, pending uh, additional review of how those traffic control measures work, we're gonna do another speed study and see what happens. There are a couple other measures we're, we're looking at taking out there, looking at additional signage, uh, putting in maybe tubular delineators like we have down on Redondo Beach Drive or uh, 272nd where you have kind of those delineators in the center line of the road for additional visibility uh, and looking at just increasing signage, things like that. So we are being very proactive. It kind of just takes a little bit of time. Once we implement a few things, <clears throat> we look at the effectiveness uh, and then we kind of take the next step if we still see some issues out there. Overall, since 2014, from the accident data, uh, we've got about, I think about eight accidents since 2014. Uh, so it's kind of just the recent ones that have kind of caught everybody's attention, but we are actively pursuing a couple of measures to help uh, calm traffic down, predominantly trying to slow folks down going around that corner down there. 
And I just want to add, I appreciate the uh, history there, Andrew. And, and I think that he, you know, Andrew's task with looking at this curve, uh, uh, you know, in, um, in comparison and, and um, fairly with the other locations in the city from an operational perspective. And, and we've heard from the public, we'll, we'll be responding and, and monitoring. I do want to point out, though, that whether or not it, a single resident has a concern or, or a, a whole group, we, we, we take those seriously. Um, and so it's not necessarily a, um, a popularity contest. You know, we, we take engineering concerns very seriously. So I just wanted to uh, let the citizens know that, that whether they're the lone concern or not, we, we look into everyone that we receive. So that's all. Okay. And Moving to my report, uh, I'm going to start with um, the Arts Commission update, and I'm going to have uh, turn it over to Nicole Nordholm. We didn't have a particular spot on the agenda for it, so I took it. So, Nicole, thank uh, you, thank to you to Mayor, you. Council, um, in lieu of Councilmember Banks, I will just give a brief update. Um, the Arts Commission met this past Monday, and we had a great presentation from a local artist, uh, Colleen Silviera, who we're partnering with to do the Midway Park mural. And she presented um, three different pieces of art that the commission then voted on, and they were all great. I mean, it's a kind of a collaboration of um, local kids submitted art, as well as community members' input just on what their vision for community in Des Moines is. So they did um, make their selection, and they're going to be with the children, um, working on getting that painted mid-July. I believe it's July 16th through 18th. Um, secondly, the commission talked a bit about um, kind of moving on with an abbreviated summer concert in the park series. And so that'll be adjusted, of course, due to depending on you know COVID guidelines and that kind of thing. But they're excited to just get planning with some um, the Wednesday night concerts in the park, which is exciting. And then lastly, uh, last week, the Senior Services Commission um, put on their annual paper shredding event down at the marina. And so that was pretty successful. I think 75 cars attended and they shredded over 3,200 pounds of paper and documents. So thanks to our marina staff, as well as to um, the committee, Jeff Crump, our um, committee chair, puts that on every year and it's pretty successful. So that concludes my report. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to uh, let the council know that a letter to the Port of Seattle from our SEPA official, Susan Cesar, and the administrators of our four neighboring cities, Burien, SeaTac, Normandy Park, and Des Moines, supporting the concerns raised in recent community petition related to a proposed parking lot in the North SeaTac Park has been uh, generated. I also signed a letter that reads, um, the Des Moines City Council supports the concerns raised in the recent community petition related to a proposed parking lot in the North SeaTac Park. The petition calls on the port to withdraw the proposal in, within the SAMP that would remove acres of forest within the boundaries of the North SeaTac Park for an employee parking lot. A number of Des Moines City Council members have signed this peti petition as well as representatives of nearby cities. The city of Des Moines supports the community in seeking to minimize and mitigate environmental impacts of the SAMP and specifically re, uh, related to this project and unwarranted tree removal. The project would result in removal of a large number of healthy trees and the loss of use of the park. The city continues to object to any movement towards implementation of the SAMP in near terms, absent completion of the environmental review and to segment of the environmental review process. Reference the city's previous comments on the SAMP near-term projects environmental scoping review assigned by myself. Um, and then finally, you know, I've been, I've, it's a lot, several emails and, and social media posts have been brought to my attention lately. And it's a little troubling uh, in that I see people calling people's names in an attempt to label and discredit them. And oftentimes it's the same individual, sometimes it's not. I mean, if you've experienced bad behavior, then you really know it. But just because someone says or claims something was true or called somebody a, a name, 
It doesn't make it real. It doesn't make it true. Keep in mind that this is a political time. Many mistruths are stated by unscrupulous individuals in an attempt to mislead the populace. Search for the proof. When things are said, ask, ask for the proof, ask for the evidence. Talk to the accused. Because if you saw it, that's one thing. But this is, there's, there's a great deal of misleading and, and informa information and incorrect information that comes out there. And just because it's on the internet, folks, it doesn't mean it's true. So I want to encourage people to think about it. As a populace, when we see or hear things, we have to, it's, it's incumbent upon us to go research it, look at where the truth is. Look at some of these people that are out there that you may or may not know on Facebook and check those profiles. If they're empty or very light, there's chances that it's probably not a legitimate person. But I also wanna point out that when you put other people down, a lot of times people do that to try and bring themselves up. And in my opinion, it's just another form of hate and hate has no place here. So I wanna encourage people, check the information. Don't just say, I read it, I saw it, someone said it, it's true. Become educated about those people that are out there that are talking. If you're gonna believe somebody, you better, you better understand your source. That's all I have to say on that. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Our next meeting will be on July 8th, 2021. I'm looking for a motion. I see Councilmember Nutting's hand. Motion to adjourn. Second by Deputy Mayor Mahoney. All those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Martinelli, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Buxton, and myself. We are adjourned, folks. Stay healthy and safe. See you soon.